Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Everybody, bless the Lord one more time. Again, let me take the time out to welcome each and every one that is tuning in to, you know, our Bible study. You know, and we really give God thanks for the opportunity to come, you know, and to just share, you know, something that he has laid in my spirit. You know, and I believe that it is fitting for the time that we are living in. Amen. Just before we go any further, I'm going to just open in prayer and then we can just get into it. Lord, we come before you this evening and we give you thanks, God, for your blessings. We thank you, God, for your mercies and your love towards us. God, they cease not. And we thank you, God, that we can be, bear your name and be called your sons. God, as we are here tonight and we want to talk about doctrines, we pray, God, that you will be in our midst. We pray, God, that you will open our understanding. And we pray, mighty God, that when all is said and done, that Jesus, your people, be edified. Lord, we pray that you speak tonight and that you will have your own way. Touch God both save and unsave and accomplish your perfect will. We give you thanks right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Again, let me say welcome. You know, you know God is such a good God. And in his presence there is fullness of joy and at his right and there are pleasures forevermore. We have been talking about doctrine. And you know, it's a broad heading doctrine. We can never cover all the doctrines that there are nowadays you know so you know i want to focus you know on what the scripture says and what and the doctrine doctrines that are mentioned in scriptures right so as we go through tonight we are going to do a little bit of recap but what i've done with the recap you know i've some of the things last week i mentioned them but um there was not any scripture some of them just come to my spirit and i mentioned them and, you know, what I did now is that I put, put in some of these scriptures. So as we recap, you know, some of the things you would have heard from last week, some of the things you would not have heard. And we're just going through again. We want to strengthen the points, you know, because we want us to understand that what we are in is not any plaything. And, you know, God has called us to his kingdom for such a time as this. And the adversary is trying to distract us from the kingdom of God. And like I said, you know, last week, some of the things that he's doing, and one of the things that he's doing is that we have seen an increase in false doctrine and false teaching. Um, so the scripture, our theme scripture is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 to verse 3, and then 2 Timothy 4, 1 to Verse 4. And let us just turn to them and we're going to read them quickly. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Amen. Let us look now at 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4. So I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth 
and shall be turned unto fables. Amen. So last week, you know, my main, my main, main reason, re real burden, you know, why, you know, what I'm feeling, you know, is for souls. Because you don't want, you, it is not good to see somebody that is born in the truth, grow up in the truth, and then at a certain age depart from the truth. You know, it's one of the most painful things to see somebody know the truth and then they turn from the truth and, you know, follow a lie, as it were. And it's a burden that I have, you know, that I want souls to, you know, remain saved. I want souls to understand that, you know, this doctrine that we talk about, the apostles' doctrine, you know, it is extremely important, right? And the apostle, as he spoke to Timothy, in 1 Timothy, he spoke about doctrine to him, right? And then here in 2 Timothy, he charged him and said, look here, I charge you to teach the gospel. I charge you to preach it in season and out of, sea, out of season. So, like I said last week, that, you know, some of the doctrines that were mentioned, you know, in scriptures, and probably if, you, if we have not taken a look at it, but if we look, for example, at Matthew chapter 6 and verses 12, you know, the Jesus mentioned in that passage about the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And then when we go to Revelation 2, verses 14, the, 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 the Bible in Revelation talks to the Nicolaitans about the, 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 about the church there, and it talks to them about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And here what it's in Revelation 2, verse 14. It says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast dear them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast tumbling blocks before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. And the Bible is saying that this now is the doctrine of Balaam. And I want us to know that if this thing affected that which was a, 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 a shadow of the church, in the church age, it also affects the church. And we are going to look back at the scripture further, further on in our studies. And we are going to look what the things that Balaam did. But also in the church, this was now in Revelation, in the church. Christ was saying that, look here, folks are in the church that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And then if you look in Revelation 2, verses 15. Again, we look now at the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, right? And the Bible says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I eat, right? And we are going to take our time and we are going to look at what the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is. Because some persons don't know how important leadership is. And we are going to look at what took place at that time with the Nicolaitans. Then when we look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 20, we are going to see now that the Bible now talks about the doctrine of Jezebel. Notwithstanding, say, I have few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, mighty God, and, 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 and let me just said this to us. We have never seen a time when there is so much prophetess. I am not just talking to you based on how I feel and the things that I heard, but I am talking to you from the scripture. The Bible says, right, that notwithstanding I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. And we have seen it in this day and age that there are so many prophetess that is on the rise. And here what the Bible says now, that lady which calleth herself a prophetess to teach 
and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Again, we are going to look back on that lady Jezebel back in the book of, of Kings. And we are going to look at the things that, you know, took place at that time. And you're going to understand how Jezebel worked, how the spirit worked, right? And it is in the church. If we are not careful, you will find persons saying that they are prophet, prophetess. And they are workers of Satan himself. That put themselves in the church. They're not, they're not in the church, you know, but they are among the saints to destroy the saints. Because the church must be the church, and there's just a true church. It's either you're in the church or you're not in the church. But remember we also said that there are wolves in sheep clothing. We also said last week that when we look in the church arena, a lot of things are happening. And again, we can see the effect that COVID is having on us, even as a church. Because... Last week we were able to do the different groups. This week we are down to 50. When we come to church on Sunday, we are down to 50. And again, we are going to have to be streaming. Um, most of the folks have to be streaming online. So the coronavirus has an effect, and the effect that it is having on us as individuals, it is that it is causing us to steer away from the church and stay away from gathering. And we mentioned the scripture last week that the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. We can't come to prayer meeting anymore. We don't have that. We have online, but it's just not the same. We used to have our all night, but it's it, it just not the same, right? Youth service, youth have to be streaming online. Um, that might be down your line because, you know, the tech and they are into the technology. But it is just not the same when they are in church. Look here. And I can tell you this. When we leave our homes and come to church, we are in church worshiping God. But you see, when we are at home, some of the times, while we are listening to the service, while we are worshiping, we are cooking. Some of the times, while we are listening to the service, we are worshiping and singing. We are cleaning, and total focus on God is not there. It's not like when we come to the house of God. You know, sometimes when we have Bible study, people, you know, ask some questions at the end, and it's just not the same when we're doing it online. So we get less time together, and we say that the Bible says that um, you can't get that word of exhortation from your brother because, you know, your brother... When him see you, God can just drop something in his spirit and him just talk to you right away. But when it comes to, to you being away, him can't see you, God might drop you in his spirit, you know. But what he has to do is to pray or if by chance he has your number, he can call you, send you a WhatsApp. But most of the time, you know, right now, the person just has to call. And, and it's just the way it is. But we are saying that because of the COVID and because of what is happening, we have seen a flurry. We have seen growth in online churches. And what is happening is that folks just pop up and they are having services online. And if we are not careful as believers, you are going to find ourselves watching some people, getting attached to these people, listening to them. I also said last week that some of the times your bishop, your pastor can spend years trying to cultivate a certain thing in you. And one service, five minutes you spend and listen to an individual can undo what your bishop, what your pastor tries to do over an extended period of time. So I want us to understand as, as saints, while I cannot stop you from listening to who you want to listen to, I want you to understand that so many things are popping up and these persons are prophet, this evangelist, this pastor, this, and they have come up all of a sudden out of the blues. And a lot of folks are gravitating to these preachers and teachers. 
and the things that they are saying. Some of them are not scriptural based. And we find ourselves attaching ourselves and, and, and embracing some of these thoughts that is pushed forward by these preachers and teachers. And it is causing a problem in the church. So I want us to know that as children of God, other than the call that there is, you know, for everybody to come together, we just have doctrine popping up all over, and we must be careful. We said last week that, you know, there's this call for all churches or denomination to come together. And one of the things that they are saying is that we all believe in Jesus Christ. We all sing the same songs. We all preach the same way. We all, you know, teach the same way. We go to the same seminaries. And in essence, what these folks are saying to us is that forget about the things that you hold dear. Forget about some of these things. They are saying that we have more in common than what separates us. Let us put away the differences and unite in our efforts for world peace. So they are saying the doctrine that you know, this apostle's doctrine that you embrace, the same apostle doctrine that the Bible talks about, they are saying, no, you need to put away that. Know as an individual that loves God and want to serve God in pureness of heart, in holiness. When I hear these things, I don't take lightly to them. Because how can I put away that which I have embraced for years? That which I believe is the truth. And when we talk about the doctrine of Balaam, you are going to find out that one of the things that, 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 that Balaam suggested to Balak was that, look here, you can't curse them. So what you are going to have to do now is to get your people to go among them. And we're going to look in the scripture and we are going to see how we, look here, church, we have got to be careful. The Bible says that we should come from among them and being separate, say the Lord. So we are looking at, boy, look here, he's only seen as a man that we know him doing wrong. But look here, what fellowship have light with darkness if they're not embracing the same doctrine that you are embracing and you're hugging up and you're hand in hand, you're going to have a problem. Because it's two different standard, two different belief. And you're going to have a problem. And I, I'm saying to us as children of God that we have got to be careful. So we have got to know why we believe what we believe. And it is important. We can't just take what is being taught, even what I'm saying to you, to, and I'm making sure that, that I'm coming to you from Bible. I'm trying my very best to, to, to incorporate the scripture with all that I have to say. But we can't just hear what the, 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 the teacher say or the preacher say and take it as gospel. I said to us last week that we need to study the word. The Bible says that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God. A lot of the problems that we are having where people are blown away with every wind of doctrine that presents itself, it is because people do not know the word. Like I told you, you know, I am in church for a while and I've seen persons stop coming to church because of baptism. We don't say Jesus Christ, we only say Jesus. And then persons stop coming to church because of some other doctrine. Lady must not preach in church. Lady must not say anything in church. Some people stop because, you know, of attire. And a whole lot of doctrine is there and people stop. And you're going to find out 
that this false doctrine, this false teaching appeals to the flesh. And anywhere that, that, that you hear a doctrine that is appealing to you, you are going to go there because that is what you want. And you're going to fall, find out that false doctrine tends to, you, you want to please yourself more than pleasing God. And my Bible tells me that any man comes to God must first do what? Deny himself. First Peter 3 verses 15 and 16. Peter admonished the people he was writing to in First Peter. And he said that you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks you of your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain or to give to such a person the reason why you are in what you are in. First Peter 3, 15, But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks it, you a reason of the hope that is in you. If you are convinced about what you are in, if you are convinced that what you are in is truth, then you have got to embrace it, you have got to protect it, you have got to stand up for it, because we are in a time right now where everything is set to erode the principles it is set to stand against the principles and statutes of God that we embrace. If you are not convinced in what you are in, you are going to find that you hear something that is not, a, not truth, and you are going to find yourself swept away with that. So we established last week that doctrine is important in the passages that we read um, in 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy 4. We recognize in the, those two passages, they, I think it's about three times or four times that the word doctrine was mentioned. But if we take our time and go through the book of Timothy, 1 and 2 Timothy, and then we look even at Titus, you're going to find that the Apostle Paul mentioned doctrine a number of times. So really doctrine is important if the Apostle spend the time and talk about doctrine. If Jesus himself in his time talk about doctrine and that the doctrine that he teaches and preaches come from God and he, he taught against the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If the book of Revelation, when, when God spoke to John and he talked to John to write to the angel of the churches and he mentioned to them about the different doctrines that they were embracing, it tells us then, church, that doctrine is important. And we look at doctrine. We said that doctrine translates. The, the word there means to instruct especially as it applies to lifestyle application. In other words, doctrine is the teaching imparted by an authoritative source, and it depends on who we consider to be authoritative. The Bible says of itself that it is profitable, and this is 2 Timothy 3, verses 16, it says that it is profitable for doctrine. This is the Bible, you know. It says that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We are to be careful then about what we believe and present as truth. And let us look at 1 Timothy 4, verses 16. I want us to turn. We read it last week. 
and chart is there, I might have it on the slides again. But I want us to read this one. 1 Timothy 4, verses 16. And, and, and the Bible tells us, you know, he said, look here, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Now, when the apostle said, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, this was the doctrine that Timothy had learned. Because Timothy was grown up and his mother accepted the apostle way. So the doctrine that he was saying, take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine, it is the same apostles' doctrine. And he said, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So I want to say to the church tonight, take heed unto thyself. If you don't take heed unto thyself, you know what's going to happen? You're going to lose your soul. Take it unto thyself and unto the doctrine. This same doctrine that has been handed down to us by our forefathers. Continue in them. For in doing so, you shall what? Save yourself. And them that hear thee. So they are true and they are false doctrine. We established that from last week. And the word doctrine, you know, it refers to biblical teachings that come from the Bible and are aligned with the teachings of Christ and the apostle. This is what I consider true doctrine. It, 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 it is in the Bible. We can find it in the Bible. You can find it precept upon precept, scripture upon scripture. Scripture can interpret scripture. When we talk about doctrine, and it must be aligned with the teachings of Christ and the apostle. So, false doctrine is also real. And we would have get an understanding of that. Even in the scripture that we read, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. It tells us about false doctrine and it tells us about ungodly teachings of Satan. And those who follow these teachings really put themselves in damnation. Because you can't take heed to the doctrine of Satan, to the doctrine of demons, and think that you're serving God. You're not serving God. So it might sound good. It might... Appeal, be appealing to you, but it causes you to turn. It will cause us to turn from following after Christ. And if it does that, it can't be good for us. And we have got to raise from our slumbers and our sleep and take sleep and mark death, so to speak. For anything that is drawing us away from Christ will kill us, spiritually kill us. And we can't afford in this time to have anything at all draw us away from Christ. I want you to understand that when you get involved in 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 a in a in an assembly that is teaching false, and it, it, it might look like truth, you know, but gradually you're going to see some things come up. You're going to see some things and and and, and people knowing them, but this is not scriptural, and they're still continuing it. And this is all false teaching. It just, it just take you before you come to your spiritual senses. So the Bible in 1 Peter 5 verses 8. Let us find that one. Like I said, these teachings from demons are so luring. Before you come to your spiritual senses, you have fall from the truth. 1 Peter 5. Verse, it said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeketh whom he may devour. I said it last week. 
when the church began, we had persecution. Jesus' word to them, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. Those folks centered at Jerusalem. And what the persecution did was that it caused the gospel to spread. The adversary has been around from ages. And he learned from that. So one of the things that he's doing now is that come among them. Pretend like you're one of them. The Bible says that the wheat and the tear will grow together until the day of harvest. All of them was in one field. The wheat and the tear was in the same field. When the reaper said, look here, master, to root, root them up. Master said, no, because in doing so, you might take up the wheat. Load them until the day of harvest. And I want us to understand that as people of God, there are wolves in sheep clothing. You might not know, but there are wolves in sheep clothing. And you have got to be aware of it. What I like about the Bible, you see, and the Bible gives us an example in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. What I like about the Bible is that the Bible look out for us as man. It's God's word and it's not his will that any should perish. I like the Bible for the fact that the Bible always tells us what to do. In other words, let us look at the scripture. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there be many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there be few. So the Bible says, enter in the gate, but not any gate. It says, enter the narrow gate, for though it is difficult, though entering through the narrow gate is difficult, it leads to life. On the inverse, it tells us not to go into the wide gate because it leads to destruction. So what I'm trying to say here is that the Bible, God loves us so much that he put it in the word and he said, look here, go through that gate. That is the gate. He tell you what to choose, you know. But God will not cause you to choose that. He will not force you to choose that. But he will tell you what to choose and why to choose it. No, it is a similar thing with doctrine. The Bible tells us of these doctrine that existed. And it tells us about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Tell us about the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and the doctrine of Jezebel. The Bible then tells us that these doctrine that we will cause us to turn from God and eventually destroy our souls. The Bible goes further and tells us to stay from these doctrine. And at the same time, it tells us to continue in the apostles' doctrine. Give you the doctrine. Say, look here, I have some things against you. You need to turn from them. You need to repent. Because these things are there to destroy you. But at the same time, it encourages us to, to let us look at Galatians chapter 1, 6 to 9. At the same time, the Bible encourages us and it says, look here, continue in the apostles' doctrine. This was Paul now writing to the Galatians. And he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that call you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. And like I said, this is where my burden is because folks have been removed 
from him that called us into his grace and to something else. We still leave our homes, dress up, but where we are going, it is a place that preach something else. Another gospel, which is not another. Oh God. But there be some that troubled you and would pervert. That word pervert there comes from the Greek metas trefo, which means to turn across. So what Paul was saying now, that these men and the, these places, they turn the gospel across. Or it corrupt the gospel. Or it turn the gospel another way. But he said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. As we said unto you, so I know again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that he have received, let him be a curse. If any other man preach any other gospel unto you, let him be, is a curse, this, you know. So, so is a, there's a curse on persons that preach and teach false doctrine. So let us now look at <coughs> true doctrine versus false doctrine. Because we must be aware that we are in a time where false doctrine is on the rise. And we must be able to identify such. So there are some things that we can look at and we are able to get a better understanding of what the true doctrine, of what a true doctrine entails, where it comes from, and what the false doctrine entails. So let us look at the first slide. And the first thing that we're going to look at now is origin. Sound doctrine originates with God. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, went through great lengths to convince them that the gospel that he taught was not his own. So this same Galatians that we just read, the Apostle said to them after he was able now to talk to them and get them to understand that what I am preaching to you is not of me. And he said, though we are an angel, but before he was able to say that and get them convinced, he had to say this to them, that this doctrine that I am telling you of, it is not of myself. So the, the scripture is there, Galatians 1, 11 to 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it of any man. Nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So... The origin of tr true doctrine, it comes from God. St. John 7, 16, even Jesus was clear when he taught that what he was teaching and instructing the folks comes from God. He said, look here, what I'm telling you of did not come of myself, but it comes from my father. Hear what the scripture says. He said, my teaching is not mine. But 
His who sent me. True doctrine originates with God. Who is true? Bible said, let God be true and every man a liar. And true doctrine originates with God himself. So, if you want to be able to identify true doctrine, you have to, know, you have to look where it originates. And it must originate from God. False doctrine on the other hand. False doctrine originate with someone or something created by God. Just as true doctrine is marked by its divine origin, false doctrine is marked by its worldly origin or its devilish origin because Satan is the God of the world. Paul warned the Colossians church to avoid doctrine that is according to human precepts and teaching and told Timothy that some would depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and things and teachings of demons. Colossians 2 verses 20 to 22. He said, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world, ye are subjected to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. The apostle said, touch not, taste not, hunger not, because all who do so will perish. And we read 1 Timothy 1 in, in our starting up. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. It is a simple thing. Sound teaching originates with God. And false teaching originates with men. Are demons. So if you want to identify true doctrine versus the false, the first thing that we need to look at is where it originates. And it originates with God. So if we take, for example, like a doctrine, like you know, people are saying that there are three gods and they are co equal and co eternal, the Bible doesn't teach us that. Where did that originate from? So we, we, when, when, you, when you want to identify true doctrine versus the false, you have to look in the scriptures and look at where they are originated from. The second thing that we must look at in, in identifying true versus false is the authority of is the authority of both the authority of sound doctrine is grounded in scripture in other words the bible the, this doctrine that we embrace gets its authority from the scripture which is the word of god the word of god the bible is infallible sufficient complete and authoritative from which sound doctrine can be established. So if a man is going to present a doctrine, we must look at the authority of it. And the authority must come from scriptures, which is the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable 
So all scriptures that we get is given by the inspiration. That word inspiration means God breathed. So God breathed into man what he wanted them to, 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 to write, what he wanted them to write. And from that, we were able to derive what we have today. So all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be completely, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Sound doctrine originates in the mind of God and is recorded in his authoritative self-revelation. The Bible, Paul praised the Thessalonians for their careful assessment and acceptance of his teaching because they understood its divine authority. First Thessalonians 2 verses 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in believers. So the, the, the Thessalonians, they took the time out and they recognized and, and, they, and they, they looked at what Paul was saying. And they recognized that what Paul was saying to them, the authority came from the word of God. On the other hand, when we talk about authority, the authority of false doctrine is grounded outside of scriptures. So when we look at the authority that the, 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 the false doctrine is coming with, it, it is not grounded in scripture. False doctrine grounds its authority from outside of scripture. So two persons can be teaching from the same passage and both claim the authority of the Bible. If we take what is happening even now, there are so many different doctrines and everybody is preaching from the same Bible. Really, the authority of false doctrine comes from Satan himself. False doctrine is a lie and Satan is the father of lie. The Bible says in John 8 verses 44, he said, you are of your father. This was Jesus talking now. You are of your father, the devil. And the desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. This is where we are going to look at the next. Because this now lead right into the next one. So Satan now is the father of lie. But before we, go, we get there, look at this. Luke 4, 9 to 12. Even when he knew scriptures, even when he knew scriptures, It still have no basis. It is used to deceive. If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, he shall give his angel charge over thee to keep thee in their hands. And they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering him said unto him, 
It is said, Thou shall not tempt the Lord. Even when the adversary used the word, he used it to deceive individuals. So, like I said earlier on, two persons might be talking from the same passage. And one used the passage to, 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 to cover, to talk about, or to, 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 to embrace two doctrines. But the other one used the same scripture. And in talking something like the truth, but it's not the truth. Even though the scripture is used. And Satan used the scripture and said to the Lord, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Because it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to, to keep thee if thou dash thy foot against a stone. So, so, so even when he used the scripture, it is there to deceive. But I want us to know that when it comes to the authority, if you want to know the difference, the authority comes from the word of God. But... On the other hand, the authority of false doctrine comes from Satan himself because it's not true, it's a lie. And he is the father of lie. It leads us down to the third point when we talk about consistency. Because like we were saying, two persons can be talking and they're using the same scripture. But let us look at what the Bible says about consistency. If a man come up with a doctrine and him talking about the doctrine... It has to be consistent throughout scriptures. The authority of sound doctrines is grounded in scripture. So, consistency. Sound doctrine is consistent throughout, throughout scriptures. True doctrine is consistent Throughout scripture, the writer of Hebrews warned the congregation about diverse and strange teaching. Hebrews 13, verse 9. Paul, when he warned Timothy about accepting a different doctrine, 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 6, 3, both meant to emphasize that doctrine must always be compared to established accepted body of truth. Those who are knowledgeable about that body of truth will be in the best position to immediately identify and refute what is false. There is a principle. There is a principle to which this is tied. Scripture interprets scripture. If the Bible originates in the fallible mind of God, it must be consistent throughout. Because there can be no contradiction in God. Yeah, but your people said the Bible contradicts. The Bible cannot contradict if it comes from God. The Bible said the scriptures were given by the inspiration. God breathed it into men and they wrote as they were impressed by the Holy Ghost. So there can be no contradiction in scriptures. What the Bible teaches is in one place, it will not refute it in another. So if the Bible talks about holiness, from the Old Testament is the same holiness they're going to talk about in the New Testament. Therefore, any true doctrine must be consistent throughout Scripture. Doctrine must never be treated in isolation, but always in light of a correct understanding of the entire Bible. Too many false teachers isolate verses or ideas that cannot withstand the scrutiny of the entire book. 
Therefore, any true, true doctrine must be consistent. Isaiah, the Bible says, 28, 9 to 10. I want you to listen to this one. I want you to listen to this one. Who shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Look here, this was way back there, you know. Isaiah, the prophet, God used the prophet to talk about doctrine. Who shall he teach knowledge? And who shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precepts must be upon precepts. Precept upon precept. Precept. This is a scripture, I know. Line upon line. And then the Bible says, line upon line. Here a little and dear a little. Who shall he teach knowledge? And who shall he make to understand doctrine? So what the Bible is saying, that you can't use one scripture and just make up a doctrine on one scripture. You have to be able to know, prove that which we have as a doctrine, that it is consistent with the scriptures. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand the doctrine? Just put up the scripture. I want you to see that this is what the prophet was saying. Mighty God, even from that time, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precepts must be upon precepts. Precept upon precept, the Bible, he mentioned it again. Line upon line. Line upon line again. So this is, is, is emphasizing, the Bible emphasizing that look here. It is not the babe now that going to understand the true doctrine, you know. This person that come off of the breast. Start eating a hard food. And you're going to understand line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and dear a little. So we can't just come up with one scripture. One scripture and we just have a doctrine on one scripture. Go ye therefore into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. And, and all of a sudden we have a trinity. And right through the Bible, the Bible talks about one God. I am saying to the church that if we are not careful, we will... How is it that somebody who knows the truth, you are born in truth, and all of a sudden you just say, look here, it's, it's Saturday, I have to worship on Saturday. And we've been serving God for years. And all of a sudden, we stop serving him. Gone to something else, which is not another gospel, not another doctrine. But the Bible says, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and dear a little. So we, we must be able to prove the doctrine. And, and when you put scriptures against it, it's supposed to be able to stand up. So when you put scriptures against the apostles' doctrine, it stands up. Because the Old Testament talk about Jesus. 
prophesied about him. On the other hand, when we talk about false doctrine, false doctrine is inconsistent, inconsistent throughout scripture. So false doctrine is not consistent throughout scriptures. One scripture might be used to make a doctrine. But when being scrutinized, for, it fails in the consistency test. So that is another way that we can identify true from false. This example, look at this example. Acts 16 verses 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So if we look back at the story in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas was in prison. Right? There was a, a damsel that was possessed with a spirit of divination and that damsel was following behind them. And she said, these men are men of God. And she do that for a while. But then Paul turned around and he rebuked the spirit. And the girl was now freed from the spirit. But her masters recognized that now, look here, them don't have any gain. So they went to the magistrate and said, look here, these men storing up trouble. And the, man, the magistrate beat them and locked them up. And they said, look here, make sure that these men don't get away. And the, 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 the jailer, the man was in charge of the prison, put them in the inner prison. But the Bible said Paul and Silas sang, prayed and sang praises. And while they prayed and sang praises, there was a great earthquake. The jailer was asleep. And all the bands were loose and the gates were open. When the man get up and look, he was about to kill himself. And Paul said, no, all of us, don't kill yourself. All of us is still here. He couldn't believe. And Paul and Silas talked. He said, what must I do? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And... He shall be saved. If you look, thing in Acts 16, 31, after I asked the question, Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he shall be saved. No, what is happening is that some folks have taken this scripture and said, look here, all that a man must do in order to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But is this consistent throughout scriptures? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved. I want us to understand that this comes from the depths of hell and is false. It is not consistent throughout scripture. Jesus' own words. St. John 3, verses 5. Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said that you must, he said, Verily, verily, surely, surely, you must be born, he said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, I want us to understand that even the apostles had to be born again. They believe on Jesus Christ. They walked with him for three and a half years. And they saw the miracles and they saw the great works that they did. They believe on Jesus Christ. But yet, they had to, be, they had to tarry. Until they were born of the Spirit. So when you put this. You are going to recognize. That false doctrine is inconsistent throughout scripture. You can't, somebody can't take one scripture and make it into a doctrine. And people, they're 
One of the hurtfulest things is that people, when they go to this place, and people say, look here, say this prayer with me, and you are saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are saved. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And one of the things that is, you, you, when you understand the false doctrine, so you can you imagine an auditorium filled with persons that are told that all you have to do is believe. The Bible says believe and he shall. It never says believe and you're saved, you know. Believe and you shall be, which talk about something that will happen. What will happen? And the Bible says that the apostles know as they, as they talk to the man, the man got baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said it, marvel not. You must be born again. You must be born of the water. And of, there is no way. Remember now, you know. The Apostle Paul, after he came back from the desert, he went to the other apostles. And he said, this is what I got from Jesus Christ. Remember now, you know, we said that he talked, spoke with the Galatians and he said, look here, this gospel that I preach unto you, uh, this doctrine that I teach unto you comes from the God himself. It's Jesus Christ revealed it to me. Now what the Apostle Paul did, he went to the other apostles. And he said, look here, this is what I get. And they said, yes, man, are the same thing we're preaching. So it was confirmed with Peter. And when the day of Pentecost came, and Peter, they said, they said what shall we do? Because Peter preaching on them said, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Every one of you, he said, you must, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So I want us to know that you can't, can't just take up one scripture and say, look here, this is going to be the doctrine. And, and false doctrine is inconsistent wrote scriptures a lot of folks right now go to go to a place that they were that people worship and they are told mighty god they are told that look here you are saved just believe and you are saved and the bible the bible does not teach that it's a believe and it shall be something when i'm after repentance Water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that will is identifying with the death, burial, resurrection. We're going to get into it. Because it is the doctrine. So you can't just take one scripture and say, look here, and that is happening now. He said, I, I marvel how soon you have removed yourself. From him that has called you to something else which is not another gospel. True doctrine. True doctrine leads to spiritual growth. Sound doctrine is beneficial for spiritual health. Sound doctrine makes persons spiritual healthy, it makes them spiritually mature. And knowledgeable Christians. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. So when you study the word of God. And you get to, the more you study the word of God. is the more because. Remember now you know. God reveal himself in scriptures. And the more you study the word of God. is the more you get knowledgeable about him. So the more knowledge you have of God is the more he, the knowledge come from him revealing himself to you. And the only way you can get that is consistent praying, consistent fasting, and consistent reading the word. 
So true doctrine brings spiritual growth. And I can tell you this. Where I was when I started serving God. I am not at the same place now. I am at a different place. I am more mature. There are certain things I just not doing because of how because of how I embrace the word of God and the word of God is just alive and the spirit of God is just alive. But before when I before I got saved, almost every other word is a curse word come. I was talking to somebody, my mother was there and a curse word. She said, boy, what are you doing? But it, it was just in me. The last curse word that came to my mouth. It was after I get saved. Because after I get saved, a dog rushed me. And it came out because it was just a natural part. But not like no, my season. My curse word didn't come out. No curse word not coming out. So it brings spiritual growth. When you find yourself in true doctrine. But when the doctrine is false. It leads to spiritual weakness. So look here. False doctrine make individuals spiritually unhealthy. Because what's happening? You know, it might look like they are talking the truth. And then you know, when you, you join yourself to them. And one of the reasons why people leave the truth. And follow a lie. Is because they want to please themselves. So you are part of an organization. That. Don't do certain things. You can't dress a certain way. And because people want to dress a certain way, they leave that organization for another place that allows that kind of dressing. But then while they're in that organization, they find out that some other things start happening. And it kills them spiritually. So false doctrine then kills individuals, make them unhealthy spiritually, can't get them to be a mature state. Because remember, you know, the, the, the word of God is there, the teaching of the word of God is to get us to a mature stage. And, and, and people, when you, when you follow the false doctrine and you're not getting that, you can't reach a mature stage. You're still ignorant. Not knowledgeable about the word of God. And then that will ultimately put you in a backsliding state. So we have to be careful. True doctrine. Sound doctrine. Has value. For godly living. Truth never stands on its own, but always has implication in life. Doctrine is always meant to lead to doxology, worship, and purposeful living. All scripture will say is God breed. Came out of God. And is profitable for reproof, for correction. For training in righteousness that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. So sound doctrine has value for godly living. Paul preached, Paul charged Titus to teach what occurs with sound doctrine. Reminding him that such doctrine is excellent and is profitable for the people. So you can look at Titus 3, verses 8, and 2, verse 1, for those. So it leads to godly living. And then now, the false doctrine leads to ungodly living. So just like I said to us, false doctrine, you can find Jude one, Jude 4. So false doctrine leads to ungodly living by casting folks, causing folks to believe a lie.
and you talk about it. For there are certain men crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, and godly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. In other words, the turning the grace of God is a license to sin. So anytime somebody do something and they come to church, oh, look here, we're not saying that God don't forgive you, you know, because who are we to condemn? If the person do it a million times, it is okay. It can't be understand if somebody make a mistake. But when it happens over and over and over, so some folks, what they do now, they, they, they make the grace of God come like a license to sin. And they deny the only Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, ungodly, false doctrine leads to ungodly living. You can't, you don't think that you're going to follow false doctrine. And, lead, and, 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 and that is why the Bible may mention that, look here, we're going to put away the false doctrine. Jesus said to say in Revelation, put away the false doctrine. Sound doctrine leads to salvation. Sound doctrine is important because of its end. Sound doctrine leads to life, eternal. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. By so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And we read it already. Sound doctrine leads to salvation. If you embrace sound doctrine, if you follow sound doctrine, you will inherit eternal life. 1 Timothy 4, verses 16. But false doctrine leads to condemnation. False doctrine leads to condemnation. It leads to ruin. Jesus spoke of the great crash awaiting the one who built his house on the sun. Matthew 7, verses 27. He said, if you build your house upon the sun, the rains will come and the house will come down. And right now, folks' house are coming down because the rain of fall doctrine is here. Never a time like now we have seen the increase in false doctrine. It is raining. And folks are losing their house. False doctrine leads to condemnation. Eternal condemnation. Because what? False doctrine don't tell you about the plan of salvation, you know. There are mega churches in the United States and you will go to church for five years and you will never hear the plan of salvation. You will never hear the plan of salvation. So they will talk and they will tell you that, look here, God is going to bless you. God is going to take you out. God is going to this. Yes, God will do all of that. But tell a man how to be. And, and, and so these men, they, they preach a pretty gospel, so to speak. They preach a, a good thing because look here. One of the things that the gospel does, you know, preaching the gospel does. It convicts men that men know that they are sinners. But false doctrine won't do that. You come in your sin and then pat you down in your sin. 
some of these ministers, even before, if they if they if they're going to mention something about homosexuality, the first thing that comes out of their mouth, how, you know, um, I understand that this might be sensitive, and and persons that might be in the congregation, and and um, my cousin is an homosexual, and then they they have to pat the pat it down first before they mention it. But gospel, Jesus was a serious man, you know. And when him talk, one of the time I think his mother came and him bridging, and him said, "Who is my mother? And who is my brethren?" So he was serious. And 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 and, and when the gospel is preached. It convicts men, and men will recognize that they are sinners. When Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost, men recognized that they were sinners. And they said, what shall we do? When the false doctrine, the ho these mega houses, mega churches, they are there, and persons will go there and will not hear how to be saved. False doctrine. Those that embrace false doctrine, they rather to have a, 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 a congregation of 10,000, but none of them is saved. For true doctrine will lead to salvation and to live to life eternal. False doctrine will ruin your souls. So church, we have got to be aware of what is happening and we got to be able to identify what the true doctrine entails and what makes up a true, true doctrine where it gets its authority from where it is originate from um, the, the effect of it it brings salvation and what the false doctrine entails don't give salvation cause damn condemnation it is it is get its authority from Satan because it is a lie and Satan is the father of life. So when can we consider a doctrine to be true, biblical? Um, I think we mentioned this last week that when we have, have, have discussion on issues, it can fall into four categories. It can be an unbiblical issue. Um, it, it is opposed to the teachings of God. It can be an extra biblical issue. It is outside are not mentioned in the Bible. And three, it can be biblically based. It is connected to the teachings of the Bible. And four, it is biblical. Right? And I want to just look back a little bit at, at point three. All right, biblical base. The doctrine that is biblical base can be can be based upon principles that are found in the Bible. While it is not mentioned verbatim in scriptures, or it is not directly taught in the Bible, when biblical principles are applied to a situation, we can confidently teach it as a biblical-based doctrine. We talk about smoking Last week, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. So though the Bible did not mention, so look here, a man must not smoke a spliff and he must not smoke a cigarette. That is verbatim. A lot of folks would not wear certain things. So just like how the Bible said, thou shall not kill. So when they hear thou shall not kill, they say, look here, I'm not going to kill because the Bible says so. But if it don't say, don't wear tight clothes to expose yourself. If it's not in the Bible, they're not doing it. So, for example, we say for smoking. Though the words don't smoke was not mentioned in the Bible, in the Bible, verbatim, word for word, we can assert from the principle of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, that men should not smoke. Why? The Bible says, your body 
is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is within you. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So we know smoking kills, smoking cuts cancer. And if our body is the temple of God, which the Holy Spirit, we can argue upon the principle that, look here, don't smoke because the body is the temple of the Lord. But there is a danger that lies for some folks. For if the Bible does not say it word for word, verbatim, then they don't want to hear about it. Show me where it is written. Hallelujah. Show me where it is written and I will do it. When you come to me and talk to me, you have to talk to me with scripture and show me where it is written. Hallelujah. But I want us to read this scripture. Jeremiah 31. 31 to 33. Don't tell me, man. I want you to show me in scriptures. Show me in scriptures. And I will stop where the revealing flows. Show me in scripture. And I won't do it again. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Pay close attention to this one saint. The Bible in Jeremiah says, Behold, the days cometh, and the days are here now. Say the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the old covenant was written. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the first covenant was written on stones. So people are saying, that look here, if it's not written in the Bible, don't tell me. The Bible is saying that in this era that we are in, the era of the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Ghost, God has now right on the tables of our heart. He said that he went write it on the inward parts. He write it in our consciences through the Holy Ghost. He said, I will put my law in their inward parts and write them in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. I want the church to know tonight that not everything will be written verbatim in scriptures. Word for word, no. However, the Lord through the Holy Ghost has written his law on the tables of our hearts. So some things are not written in the Bible, but guess what? I am convicted about it, and I'm not going to do it. But this is me. But you are saying that it must be written in scriptures. I am going to tell you that it, it is not always going to be written in scriptures. Because the principles are dear. And the principles are dear to guide us. 
The Holy Ghost is there to convict us and guide us. When we're going wrong, the Holy Ghost, you know that whenever time you dress a certain way and do certain things, you have to fight with your conscience. You ever have to fight with your conscience yet? It means that your conscience is alive. It means that the Holy Ghost is alive and the Holy Ghost is talking to you through your conscience. It is the law that is written on the inside by the Holy Spirit. Saying to you that that is wrong. If you have to fight yourself and convince yourself that nothing is wrong with it. Something is wrong with it. If you have to fight yourself, if you have to convince yourself that nothing is wrong with it, something is wrong with it. But if you continue to do it, your conscience becomes seared with that thing. So you don't have to fight yourself anymore. So the Holy Ghost see that now, look here, you want to do that thing, so he just allow you to do it. But if you have to fight somebody, I want you to know tonight that it is going against what is written in your heart. So though it might not be mentioned verbatim in scriptures, once the principles are there, we can take it as doctrine. I want us to know that there, are, that there are enough principles in scriptures to govern us, to govern how we live. Enough is in scripture to guide us in our living for God. If it is holiness, it is there. If it is how to dress modestly, it is there. Bible tells us about dressing modestly. But persons want to see the Bible say, don't wear this, don't do that. And it's just not going to be written in the Bible. But the principle is there. There's a principle of holiness. And if as a female. They can dress. Clothes well second. So that when they on the road. A, 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 a man can say. Hi baby you look good. It, 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 and you have to fight your conscience, you know that, look here, something is wrong. So if it's how to dress modestly, it's there. You have to know, let the Holy Ghost that is written on the inside tells you that, look here, that's still too revealing. So if it is how to love, Enough is in the scriptures to guide us in living for God. There is enough in scriptures. There is principles. And the Bible in Jeremiah 31 verses 33. So I don't want to hear. If you want to hold it, then fine. But it can't, it is not. Scripturally based. The principle is there. And if we're going to live by the principle, we can take the principles as doctrine. The Bible said that we must live holy. Tell us everything to do to live holy. No. But the Holy Ghost is there to help us. The word is there. The principles are there. For us to live holy. I want to tell us tonight. That if we are serious to. Serious to live for God. We can live for him. If we are serious about making it into the rapture. We can make it into the rapture. We have enough in the scripture. We have enough principles. To guide our lives. That we can make it into the rapture. I want to hear from the Lord. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. God bless you tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus. God's willing. Next week we will.
continue, we'll pick up from where we leave off, and we will continue to, to talk about doctrines, and we will look at, at, at what we believe in as a church, as our doctrine, and then we will look at some of these other doctrines and what they entail and how it is that they are trying to, Satan is trying to use these doctrines to destroy the people of God. So it's all about us being aware of what is happening and it's all about saving our souls. God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we come to you one more time and we want to bless your great name. We want to thank you for that which was said. We pray, mighty God, that you will touch the hearts and the mind. You know everyone and you know where we are with you. We pray, mighty God, that when all is said and done, we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We want to see your face. We want to bask in your presence and feast at your glory. Lord Jesus, the adversary is like a roaring lion. Lord, he's trying to distract us. He's trying to, to trip us up. God is presenting many things before us. But we pray, God, for the saints tonight. We pray, God, for the church tonight. God, that we will hold to sound doctrine and hold to that which has been passed down to us by our forefathers. We pray, God, that we will not compromise and we will not give up this for anything. We ask, God, that you bless us and continue to keep us and strengthen us as we go through the rest of the week. We give you thanks, God, for your love and your mercies. And we thank you for hearing tonight and answering. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. By way of announcement, I would like to, as we, we know, we, the Prime Minister has implemented new measure um, because their, the, the COVID cases are increasing and, you know, there are new measures. So now in church, again, we can only have 50 persons. So we are going back to what we had a couple of weeks ago where we have 50 slots, 25 will be for leaders, for visitors, for the singers, for the musicians, for the technicians, camera persons. And then we will have another 25 spaces for scenes. Now it is as before, the first 25 scenes that calls the office, then we are going to those are the persons who will be given the space to, you know, come and worship under the tent. So it's the first 25 person to call in, and I guess we all know the church number is 9050484. God bless you again in the name of the Lord. So call, so you, you, you can start calling from Wednesday. Right, so tomorrow you can you, you can call in, and the number is nine zero five zero four eight four. God bless you again, in the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs>